You know you miss one week around here, and that's what happens. <laughs> I don't think that got approved by management, did it? <laughs> so good to see you. My name's Randy. Um, especially glad to have you if you're a first timer or a second timer in the room today. Love to get to know you a little bit better at the at the tent out there as uh, the Stokes did such a good job telling us about if you don't mind fill out that little card or get one out there if you don't have one and uh, they'd love to give you a little gift and some things to help talk about our groups and everything we're big on groups here so we just want you to feel at home we just want you to be comfortable in the setting here today and then we want it to be God's will from here I always give a shout out to our online and thank you for viewing all of you but today my shout out is for all of you who may be out there who normally are in here or you're in some place of worship and you can't today because of what happened this last week with all the weather. So those of us may be here who are very fortunate and very blessed by God's grace, we do want to be mindful and sensitive to there's a lot of you who are in a tough place today or there's a level of, of um, suffering or loss and we want to pray for you right now. So can we do that? Let's pray. Lord, lift up all in our community and other communities around here, the Edisto region and others up and down the coast that experienced um, really, really bad situations. And so, God, would you just today especially remind them of your presence. Remind them that um, with, a, with loss, there all, always comes a a rebuilding effort, a renewal that you can bring. And so, Lord, just assure them today that the things that truly matter the most, they've not lost, and that um, your wisdom and your guidance is still there. For us in the room here and watching online, Lord, don't let this be a waste of a few minutes. Would you remove in me and in us anything that's distracting, anything that's not god and would you allow us the ability to focus on your word through your spirit and to understand that you're always calling us, you're always compelling us. And so please do that today. We ask in Christ's name, amen. We always have a little time at the end after I talk where we invite you forward to come and pray over anything you got going on or we, we love to celebrate decisions whether it's a profession of your faith and now you have that relationship with Jesus and you'd like to maybe uh, join the church by that and talk about baptism a little bit more or you've already done that, you've been a Christ follower, you just need a church or whatever applies to you. We say around here, we all have a next step spiritually that he's doing this and it's up to us whether we're going to choose to follow that or not and that applies to to all of us. So we're in Acts chapter 16. I'll let you go ahead and turn to that starting a new series called, as you obviously have figured out by now, um, Braveheart. You know, the, the actual person and then the legend of William Wallace is just so attractive because there's this courageous fight for freedom and it actually took place in the first Scottish war for freedom a long, long time ago. But Paul is a first century A.D. example to me of a brave heart also who was absolutely courageous. Once he met Jesus and his whole life got turned upside down, this guy is unbelievable in his pursuit of just whatever God wanted for him. And so next four weeks, we're going to look at a, a different narrative in the book of Acts that portrays that, not just to admire Paul, but to be instructional to us on a, on a different level, we all are faced with challenges to our faith and all have a place to go and you all have a call. Let me just say this. You hear it, I think the, the, uh, Bobby and Beth said it at the earlier service. I wasn't in here for this one. They may have. You're not here by accident. Whether you are here for the next 30 years or whether you never come back in this room again or watch online again, you're here for a purpose that's a divine purpose by God today and let me tell you this he wastes nothing God takes advantage of every opportunity if I let him 
And if you'll allow it today, he wants to sink something really deeply inside your soul and my soul. He wants to change me and you in some way today. Or else you wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be here. So it, it really is. There is there really is something sacred about all this. So to set this up, let me take you back a long time ago. When I was in college, uh, two of the summers that I was home, I worked for this industrial plant not too far from where I lived, and there were uh, usually five of us, five college student guys on this crew, and it was just, we were just called the outside crew, and that's what we did. We just did the grunt work. We did what was needed, whether it was mowing grass, bush hogging, taking a dump truck and emptying the whole trash thing from the whole plant and taking it away and all that stuff. We just did, we had a supervisor. He had been there 20 something years. I'll call him JC to protect the innocent there. JC had been doing that for most of his 20 years, supervising young guys. And I just thought it, it was very fascinating. By the end of my second summer, I knew him very well. He's a good man. But he had figured out how to not only survive in that system, but to thrive in that system and to be absolutely comfortable in that system and to use it to his benefit while giving the appearance of productivity. Are you, are you following me? He had that figured out, and he was an expert at it. And I noticed our hours were 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., and I noticed wherever we were all strung out all across those 40 acres or what, not doing jobs, that when 2 o'clock came, from 2 to 3, he slowed down that pace even more than it was the first seven hours. And he was a genius. He was not, there wasn't an athletic bone in his body. But yet, as it got closer to 3 o'clock, he was an art form, let me tell you. He, it was like the, Olymp the synchronized swimmers in the Olympics. He had it timed out to where back then, y'all, they had something called time clocks. And you punched in, they said, and punched out. And that's what determined how much you got paid for by the hour. We were on it, and he was on it. But he, we, he, would, he would arrange it to where he timed it so well. It was poetry in motion. He could start walking across the parking lot, and at exactly 3 o'clock, like the track, long-distance track runners, without breaking stride, at 3 o'clock, kawisha, kawisha, he's punching in, and he's heading toward the parking lot. It was a thing of beauty, let me tell you, without fail. We all have a little bit of that in us, don't we? I'm going to get things like I need them and like I like them. This is stable. It's predictable. I know how to do this. I'm comfortable in this. There's nothing wrong with that. We know that the younger generation, especially Gen Z, especially need stability because they came up through the COVID. They came up here in stories every day about 9 11. And we understand that. But in the spiritual realm, there's a little something dangerous about settling in to that type of stable environment. And that's what Paul goes throughout the region trying to bust up is don't settle, don't settle, don't settle. There's something more. So my, before we even get into it, let me remind you of that for me and you. There is something more he has on the other side of your next faith step. If you are willing, he's always going to take you a little further and a little more productive it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to feel not stable. It's going to feel risky. There's nothing really particularly safe about it or maybe even something that you want to be involved with. But that is the nature of the gospel. Because let me tell you, what I'm going to say a few times today is the Spirit is always looking to advance you and me. The Spirit will never settle for stagnation. The Spirit will never stop doing this. The Spirit will never stop leading if we're willing to follow. That's why we use the term Christ follower here, not Christian. Christ follower means we're on a journey. And I don't care whether you're 88 or you're 8. If you know Christ, you are on a journey. And you will choose, I will choose 
how well that, that journey goes. So let's look at verse, uh, chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. Let me read them, and then we'll break them down into something we can use. The setting is this. Paul's done what we call the first missionary journey already, two years earlier. He's circling back around now into one of the same regions, which is present-day Turkey, and revisiting the little church there. And I think, y'all, he specifically has his mind on a young guy that he sees as a, as a rising leader. Whether this boy realizes it or not, he sees it. And he's going to move in and try to take him to the next level in his faith to one day be a leader. And that's the, the gist of it. So verse 1, Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra where a disciple named Timothy lived whose mother was a Jewess and a believer and whose father was a Greek. Now, if you want, let me stop here. If you want to do some extra reading, a lot of you like to do this during the week, I would suggest 2 Timothy, a letter from Paul, same guy, to the same guy, Timothy. It's later on, and he's encouraging and challenging Timothy. Uh, so 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and chapter 3 especially. That's where he's calling out things that he sees in Timothy's life later. So verse 2, the brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews that lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. We'll explain that in a minute. Verse 5, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and they grew daily in numbers. Look at verse 5 closely. That is the key verse to this chapter. F.F. F. Bruce, theologian, said this is, might be one of the key verses in all of Paul's ministry because what they are describing here in the first century is what we would call today a revival. This is when people are so caught up in that wave, that falling of the Holy Spirit, that they, start, they go beyond, I believe, what God wants me to believe. They go beyond, I'll obey what I understand He wants me to obey. Check this out. And they go to the third level, which is, I'm getting hungry for what makes God hungry. You start to get the heart of God. And as David said, if I put my delight in the Lord, he will give me the desires of my heart, which means what matters to God will start to matter to you. What doesn't matter to God or what he thinks should be expelled, that's the way you treat that also. It's a great place to be, but it is a challenging place to be. And Paul demonstrates that. So let's, let me make a couple of points out of this. Go back to verses one and two. First thing you need to know, the gospel spreads naturally to the next generation. Verses one, I've talked about that, but we're introduced to Timothy who, who it is believed was probably about 18. This is a young guy, 18 year old Timothy, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer but whose father was a Greek. So we know a little bit of something about his family here too. This is important for later, but it's kind of what they would call in those days a mixed marriage. You got Gentile married to a Jew and they have children. Verse two, the people in that region spoke well of him. Continuous action verb, which means they always did. When you, brought, when you ask somebody on the street, what do you think about Timothy? Oh, He's a great guy. He's got good character. He was brought up well. They had nothing but praise for him. Timothy is 18. Paul is probably at least in his 50s by now. Paul is smart enough to understand, I can't be everywhere at once. I better entrust and train up as best I can some young emerging ta talent leaders to entrust to and just allow them to be who God has created and called them to be. Let's put it in today's terms, here and now in this place. We are one church, two locations, five services. We are four generations under this roof every single Sunday that we meet. Four generations at Pinewood every single Sunday that they meet. That is a wonderful thing. 
That is, that is a good glimpse of how the kingdom of God ought to be. And the, the ability to interact is awesome. Now, also, let me remind you that the staff team here, us ministers, we represent all four generations also. I think that's a great thing, and it helps us to understand um, everybody, I think, here a little bit better because we're trying to understand how to communicate with each other a little bit better, right? It's a say, it's a say, and we don't see things always the same. That is, that is a good, good thing. But God needs to use all the generations. Most of the programs and the things that we have in place are not geared for people my age. They're geared for the, young, the youngest two generations. And that's how it ought to be. It doesn't mean if you're my age, doesn't mean that you don't matter anymore. Of course you do. But we've had our day. It's time for us now to be investing in the younger people because if we don't, we won't exist in another generation. We're one, one generation away from extinction. And so that's just an imperative thing. God is an inclusive God. He brings people from everywhere and all kinds of life situations and all kinds of ages to get his job done. Let me ask you a question. There may be not a right or wrong answer here. In this world, in the, va in the, in the thing of spiritual leadership and everything, do you think experience is overrated, possibly? What do you think? I think it is. Not that it doesn't matter. But sometimes our experience, old, our old, or us old fellas, our experience works against us because we do the JC thing. We settle into a system that we're very comfortable with and we just repeat it over and over. There's nothing like getting put in a situation where you're a little bit uncomfortable. You might be slightly over your head because you're going to learn faster than anybody else. Have they ever been in that at work? Or maybe even here? <laughs> they give you a, a, a role and you're like, I don't know how to do that. Well, well, let's figure it out. Let's figure it out. And before my ministry days, I was in this chemical plant. And the guy I had an appointment with, a maintenance supervisor, he came up and introduced himself, and he said, hey, I'm Gus. I got, I got 34 years of experience in this place. The guy behind him smirked, I noticed, when he said that. He, Gus moves on, so me and this guy start talking. I said, well, I kind of noticed when he said he had 34 years, and he said he doesn't have 34 years. He's got one year of experience. He's repeated it 33 times. And that can be the danger here in this, in this realm, right? If we're not growing, we are losing. That is why God, look around. God's already at it. God's already raising up young leaders. I'll just pick the staff. He's raising up men, young men like James Lawson, like Sam Lawson, like Braden Kirshner, although I'm mad at Braden Kirshner right now. He's, he's raised up um, people like Joshua Steeman up in our, normally where he is, up in our sound booth area. Joshua is a technology genius, and, and he makes so much of what happens here happen so well. But these are young leaders who are already here, and they're emerging, and they should be because they've been gifted and called by God. The best thing I can do, the best thing you can do, if you're young, lead up. If you're young, be influencing the older people around you for Christ because you're seeing the world in a way that they're not, and they may have gotten into that let's just settle and wait on the punching out at 3 o'clock syndrome. If you're older, take them under your wing. Acknowledge them. Give them some rope. Allow them to make some some mistakes. Had to go to, last weekend, I had to go to Oklahoma for a wedding. And we knew the groom's family, but m most of the people in the room, you know, for the reception and the stuff afterwards and all that, I didn't know them. So I just found myself watching people, which I like to do. And one by one, the groomsmen that were in the wedding 
almost every one of them, one by one through the course of the evening, would make his way over to the father of the groom who I went to seminary with and was friends with, and I would watch them interact for a few minutes, and then these young guys would move on, and it occurred to me, you know what? These guys, the friends of the guy who just got married, Luke, his son, they're going to come over and they're going to hang out with Luke's dad when Luke doesn't even live there anymore. Am I and you, are we living a life such that one day our children's friends still like to hang out with us, even if they're no longer there? Because there's something about the love of God that is in all of us. I'm as sure of this as anything I've ever been as sure of in my life. God is doing something. And God is advancing some of you. And if you don't know it yet, you need to wake up to that. The second thing is verse 3. Um, we need to engage the culture to open doors. Verse 3, he wants to take Timothy along. <clears throat> He's inexperienced, but he's training him. So he's, what does he do? He's circumcised. What's that got to do with training a young Christ, Christian leader? Circumcision. Now, some of you who are pretty good Bible students, you probably have a, a problem with this verse, don't you? And you should, because you've read the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians is a letter where Paul is hot. He is upset at a church. Because they've come to know Jesus legitimately through the gospel, but over time they've eroded back into the old system. Let's do the foot washings. Let's do the uh, dietary thing, the kosher meals. Let's do circumcision. Let's act like the let's act like Judaism and call it Christianity, and Paul is upset about that. He says it's another or a twisted gospel. That's not right. This is the same region. This is in Galatia. How, how can he do this with Timothy, but yet write that? I'll tell you why. Because the church at Galatia are a bunch of believers, Christ followers, who have slipped back into the old legalistic system. They pulled the JC and they've moved back into what's comfortable for them and it has nothing to do with what the Spirit's trying to prompt them to do. Timothy is a different story. Timothy is not slipping back, but Paul is smart enough to realize he's got a Greek father and a Jewish mom the community, the, the community of Jews is going to see him as a Gentile. The community of Gentiles is going to see him as a Jew. Neither one will accept him. All the doors will be closed before he ever gets started. We can't let that happen. So let's circumcise him. This way the Jews will relate to him. The Gentiles, they don't know and don't care, so they'll relate to him also. I think it's a brilliant thing. He's not caving in to the culture he is driving the culture. That's our job, y'all. We're not here to follow the culture. There's some good things going on out there, and there's some evil things going on out there. Our job is to set the culture. It won't happen in one day, but it's going to happen. Now, in chapter 15, that's another read for you if you want to follow up for deep. Acts chapter 15 is a huge, important chapter. You know why? In Acts 15, the home office down in Jerusalem has heard the stories. There's some people who are not Jews that are professing faith in Jesus, and they're getting baptized. Is that even legal? And so they have this big meeting. They call everybody together, the apostles, the other leaders. Paul was there and all like that. And they said, we're going to sort this out. Is that legit or is this just for us Jews? And at the end of it, they rightly come up with, no, the Spirit is going to go affect who he wants to. God calls who he wants to. The good news about Jesus is for everybody, the whole world, not just us Jews. So if that's them and they're Gentiles, go affirm them and congratulate them. Give them a few basic guidelines of morality, like now that you're a Christ follower, we don't do this and we don't do that. And let them go. It was a huge landmark thing. And that's what they're going around. And in the shadow of that, Timothy 
is okay to serve here. The missionaries for years and years have called this contextualization. Contextualization is if I'm in this culture, I'm going to relate to them on their terms. I'm going to come to them where they are so I can take them where God wants them to be. The problem we had a long time ago with the indigenous Native Americans when we started moving west and taking all their land was we would group them either on reservations or confine them where they were, and the next step was thought to be we need to educate them and we need to take away their lifestyle and their culture because they need to be Americans now. And we realize now that was a huge mistake. Yeah, let them be citizens, but let them keep their heritage too. When I, I'll illustrate this way. A long time ago, I got to do a mission trip to Romania. And our team, when that Sunday rolled around, we were pretty fired up because I wanted to see how they worshiped and I wanted to be a part of that, you know. So we showed up at the little church we were helping and the pastor met us at the door and he said, hey man, we're glad that you're here, but let me kind of tell you the rules. When you come in, all the ladies are going to sit on this side. All the men are going to sit on this side. And you can't talk back and forth. And ladies, if you will, I'm going to give you this. Uh, it was a head covering, a shawl type thing. They gave every lady one of those, a head covering, because when they came into the church, they had to keep their heads covered the entire time until they got out. Now, to me, that seemed a little bit, a little bit odd and a little bit uncomfortable. But did we do it? Of course we did it. We're in Romania. There's nothing evil going on here. So in order to relate to the Romanians for the case of the gospel, of course we're going to do that. I think it's the smart thing to do. Can it ever be controversial? Can you ever be misunderstood when you're trying, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, to a Jew I'm going to be a Jew, to a Gentile I'm going to be. Of course it can be. But is it worth it? Of course it's worth it in my opinion. Because otherwise, we're voting to just sit down and stay and settle in to a system that is not supernaturally driven. It's well worth the risk. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, Bert, by the way, did a fantastic job of teaching us about the armor of God last week. Two weeks ago, there was like between the two places, like 17 or 18 baptisms. To me, that's a reminder of, yeah, I think it's worth it. I think it's worth it to see people absolutely re regenerated. So the third thing, we're going to, we got to be mindful. Of, oh, let me clear it up too. Some of you still looking like you, I'm not quite sure about this. Paul is a genius at what we would call the Old Testament because he was a Pharisee at one time. He's now a scholar in what we would call the New Testament because he wrote a third of it and he lived another big chunk of it. But he puts those together and he understands how to harmonize it for the gospel of Jesus to operate through the power of the Holy Spirit. So he's going to use the culture to his advantage where he can without following the culture or without allowing some of the culture that's destructive into the family of God. We are a family of God. And let me be up front with you. If we, for the sake of trying to harmonize with the culture, if we allow the brokenness of our culture into this, we've shot ourselves in the foot because now we're going in retreat. The Holy Spirit can't advance us. The Holy Spirit has to be separated from that, and then we go into reverse. And so that's the, that's the difference in all of this. we got to call that what it is. We're here to drive the culture, not follow the culture. So the third point is from verse um, 4 and 5, faith, faith flourishes best and grows in an environment of affirmation. Anybody lately got too much affirmation? too much encouragement in your life. You're like, I wish you'd just be quiet and leave me alone. Of course not. Look at verse 4 and 5. 
As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decision reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. That's that council that got together. And let me tell you, when the home office, when Jerusalem made a ruling in those days, it was intended to be permanent. It's like, no, this is forever. Verse 5, we're back to that key. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they grew daily in numbers. A revival is happening because of the environment of affirmation. God's an inclusive God. He doesn't care if you're Gentile. He doesn't care if you're Jew. He doesn't care about ethnicity. He doesn't care about socioeconomic stuff. He doesn't care about level of um, intelligence or education. He doesn't care about your age. He's going to draw everybody. He doesn't care where you're from. He's going to draw everybody into this family together, and that's when he creates what we see in verse 5. And when it says they were strengthened, that original word meant solid. In chapter 3 of Acts, the disciples, God uses them to heal a cripple, and he walks. And the same word is used. It said suddenly his ankle became strengthened, solid, and he walks into church that day. Our church, our community together is supposed to be solid. And that's what the affirmation has to do with it. The Eli Lilly Foundation in 2021 did a study of, of spiritual faith-based organizations. This was interesting to me. And it says, how do people grow within that? How does a faith-based group grow in their faith? And the, uh, not the number one, but one of the biggest determinants was different generations are interacting. And that's what we have here. When different generations interact, there's more affirmation. When there's more affirmation, the spiritual growth, it is a license to continue to develop your faith. Whether you're older or whether you're younger, it doesn't have anything to do with that. And here's another thing that we know now. Faith always goes looking for community. If you're here checking out the church or you've been here a while and you've not had an opportunity yet to connect with a life group, we call them, which is every Sunday here and even during the week in homes and Wednesday night, Sunday night, we always challenge you to do that because faith always goes looking for community. Why is that? Because we need each other. The Bible never makes a case for a solid faith person who's all alone, all by herself or all by himself. It is in the faith that we affirm each other and we grow a lot quicker. So let me give you, I think this is so timely because let me just share a little bit of an announcement. You've probably seen it on email by now. You talked about it maybe in your life group or something. Next Sunday, Lord willing, is going to be a huge day. You know why? We always celebrate in the mornings, but at 5 o'clock we have our quarterly, regular church conference. Some of you call it a business meeting. It's, a, it's just a conference where we kind of give summaries, and if there's anything important going on to vote on, we give, we give you a chance to do that. We are going to do that this Sunday because we would like to, to take a step and initiate a contract to purchase 12 acres of land in the Summers Corner area for a total of $360,000. 12 acres, you can do the math, 12 into 360,000, and that's what it is per acre, which we feel like that's the grace of God too. I say contract contingent. It's contingent on some more engineering studies we got to do. We got to make sure that it, we can use the property, but if we can, we want you to give them permission to do all of that. You following me? So if you don't show up and you don't give permission, we won't do it. You know why? (laughs) Because what we do, we do together, don't we? And this is one of those. This is a big deal because this will allow our Pinewood group one day to have a permanent place. And I believe that part of our low country is prime. They need a church like today. And if you know that area, you know all the growth is happening there. And so we're pretty excited about that, and I hope that you'll be a part. So just come a little bit before 5 o'clock, and we'll, all, we'll talk about it a little bit more, and we'll vote on it. Got it? Does that sound good? And that'll be a great affirmation of that too. 
The old analogy you've probably heard fits. In this world, in Christ's following days, there are settlers and there are pioneers. Both are needed. Every faith community needs settlers, and that is you just show me the setup, you get some structure there, you get it organized, I'll run it. I'll come in and make it better, I'll improve it, I'll connect the dots, I can manage that. We des- and some of you are those, and praise the Lord for you, because we need you. But we also need pioneers. Paul is a pioneer. Pioneers are those guys who say, I'm not really into that. I need to get out. I need to go forward. I need to blaze a trail. I need to try something. I need to be willing to, I could lose my shirt over this venture, but if God's in it, I got to find out because this could open up all kinds of doors. We need both. There's a quote, I can't find the source of who said it, but years ago, and I think it's so true, this guy said, when the need for survival gets higher than the need for following the mission in any organization, that day the organization starts to die. And I think that's especially true in churches. When we start to care more about keeping things as they are and being comfortable, and let's just make sure we can pay the bills and everything. By the way, we have enough money to pay for that $306,000. Let me just say that. So that's not what I'm saying here. But when that gets to be higher then following the mission that, that Christ has given us as Christ's followers, we've already started to die. And so we just can't let that happen. So in 1 Timothy 4.14, Paul basically says this. He's talking to Timothy, don't neglect your gift, which was given to you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. I believe that region, that that little church did what we do even today, 2,000 years later. I think they got Timothy. They laid their hands on him. They prayed over him, not because they were bestowing some superpower into him. They were just recognizing what God had already selected him to do, and Paul was taking action on. So they separate him out, and they pray over him as if to affirm him to say, now go do the ministry that God's given you to do. I love that because we still do that today. Whether it's people, you know, going into the full-time ministry, whether it's our deacon leadership, it's an act of recognizing what God has already done and affirming that. So if I can affirm you in an unlegalistic way here today, God's doing something in a lot of you. And whether it's ever expressed in this body or not that's, not, that's not my call. My call is to tell you the days of selling yourself short need to end. Don't ever underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit to do things in you that right now, frankly, are not doable. I'm absolutely convinced of that stuff because I am a grade A example of that. So it's not where you are right now, it's where you're willing to go. And if you're willing for him to come alongside of you, the Holy Spirit of God, and come alongside of you and pull you out, separate you out, and you surrender to him, and you, he empowers you, and you say, I'll do what you say do. I'll go where you say go. I want the hunger that God has manifested through you. I want a hunger after what God hungers after. You will be shocked at what he will do through you. And it's going to involve every generation around you, too. And this is what gets me charged up in a church body because every week I get to watch this. People around you that you love will change in the right direction. Broken people around you will start to get better. They'll walk out of a level of brokenness 
And you'll have no clue how that happened because that's how it ought to be because it's the Holy Spirit. And 20 years later, somebody will take you aside and say, you know what, if you had not been in her life, that would happen and you'll have no clue because you were created to be in that spot. But to do that, we need each other because, as you know, there's a mess of broken people around. And they're in my family and then your family too. So as, as our guys come to lead you, I would sure love to pray with some of you about what's going on in your life. And I would sure love to celebrate any, any decisions that you have are ready to make here to start leaning more into that um, journey that the Holy Spirit has led you. Why don't you stand and let me pray for you. God, we, uh, we don't have to be experts. We don't have to be able to read the weather or the landscape or um, take 29 courses and get a degree. We just got to be yours. We just got to belong to you. And we've got to decide, I will not settle for a life that is distant from what God has for me. I will not quit until I allow the Holy Spirit to advance me where I need to be. And so, God, as you continue to deal with us, do what you need to do. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.